I see you in your in your shorts, and yeah. your suntan, and your what smile. You you definitely you 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 definitely evince the image of the desert. But we can hear that West Virginia twang, and 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 that's obviously who you are mm-hmm. and where you came from. So I want you to take me back to little Grant Town, West Virginia, and I try to picture a little Rich Rodriguez growing up, mm-hmm. and I see these iconic images of Americana, the family farm on the dirt road, the coal yeah. mine coal where the family town. works, the yeah. big time uh, football passion at the high school. Tell me about that life growing up and also, Rich, what it was about that experience that while you, I'm sure, appreciated it on a lot of levels, you knew early on that this is not the life for me. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, I grew up in Grant Town, West Virginia. It's a coal mining town. And my dad was a coal miner, my uncles were coal miners, and everybody went to school. I mean, once you graduate high school, you want to get a job in the mines. You can make 12, 13 bucks an hour, buy a new a four-wheel drive pickup truck, and then you're living the American dream, right? Well, you know, I wanted to sports. I was obsessed with sports from an early age, but sports was a big part of the community uh, then. And, and uh, you know, it's funny, because I grew up in a little town, Grant Town, West Virginia, coal mining community. Nick Saban, who's a few years older than I did, Nick grew up in another coal mining town in Farmington, about 15 minutes away. And then Jimbo Fisher, who's a friend of mine, grew up in another little coal mining community about 25 minutes away. And so all of us, I think, had very similar backgrounds where sports was, a, especially Friday night football, was a big deal for the whole community and, and being outdoors and competing. And I think that was the one thing, more than anything, we didn't have all these levels of t-ball and all that when you played baseball there was one team one little league baseball team and you had to be good enough to play for that team whether you're eight years old or 12 years old (laughs) and if you didn't you didn't play and so I was obsessed with playing I was obsessed with sports and and I think with the the competitiveness and the work ethic and all that kind of thing I think you know a lot of us gravitated to and I think it kind of shaped a little bit of what I wanted to do uh, in life. So I know when you first went to West Virginia, um, you went as a walk-on for the football team. Did, did you only have enough money for one year of tuition? Was that kind of, if you don't make the team, you were going to be done there? How did yeah, that go I was, it was going to be tight. I had, um, you know, I walked on and I had some smaller basketball or football offers, but I was naive enough to think I want to play at the biggest level, you know, and the biggest level nearby was West Virginia. So Believe it or not, I was a good student, so I got some academic money. I believe uh, it. You know, I got some, <laughs> you know, I got some Pell Grant money because my dad, I think, was laid off in the mines at that time. And so I had just enough money to scrape by for one year. After the first year, I was going to have to probably take out too many loans and I was going to have to consider something else. But, uh, and I went there as a wideout, and the first day they moved me to DB. You know, I think because a couple of guys had left or whatever, but it was the best thing that happened because I was third team by default, and so I got reps. And so I got a scholarship after the first year, and it all worked out good. So if you didn't get that scholarship after the first year, would you have had to leave? I was probably going to have to leave just from a standpoint of financially and, and, and try to get somewhere where I could have got a scholarship, whether it's football or basketball. So you really rolled the dice because you had, you had chances to go other places on scholarship right away. Yeah, he has some smaller places in, in my mind. But, and, and those are all wonderful places. But, you know, you know, we had a lot of success in high school. had won a state championship. Well, there were four or five guys that we had beaten. You know, they had guys in our team that gotten scholarship, really good players. But me being, you know, the chip on my shoulder, like, heck, we beat them. I'm going to go try to get his scholarship. And uh, like I said, I was third team by default. One guy quit. One guy got hurt. And so I was getting reps. But uh, it worked out well. But it was a... You know, ever since then, I've always had a passion for walk-ons, you know, as a, as a head coach. You know, you got to get scholarship players. But I've had so many walk-ons that have had success and even went on to the NFL that uh, it's a pretty uh, big source of pride for me. Your first coaching job was at Salem College, right, as a, as a head coach. You were, what, 25 years old. So I was 24. I was the youngest head coach in America. Youngest head 24. coach in America. You had one losing season, they disbanded the program. Yeah, yeah, I was it. I was <laughs> Did you think, head... well, maybe coaching isn't, isn't right for me at that point? I was the youngest head coach in America at 24 and the youngest fired at 25. <laughs> and this was two weeks before my wedding, oh, and no. I had no idea it was coming. It was the middle of June. You know, football coaches, that's usually a slow time for us. But the, the school, the private school, had actually gotten bought out by a private school from uh, Japan, and they dropped about 10 programs, and football was one of them. And I was the last person to know, I think. So I called my, I called my fiance, my, my wife now, Rita, and said, honey, I got good news and bad news. She had no idea what was coming as well. 
And she said, well, I said, she said, what's the bad news? I said, well, our school got bought out and I don't have a job. She goes, well, what's the good news? I said, I'll still marry you. So we got, we got married. <laughs> lucky and, her. Yeah, lucky her, right? So she didn't marry me for my money, that's for sure. But it, uh, I, then I spent the following year after that, we well, are going to find a job in, in June, right, as a football coach. So I got uh, a lot of the players placed at different schools. All the staff got different jobs. And I found a job as a, um, a driver's education teacher at my old high school and as a volunteer coach at West Virginia University. So I did that for a year. And, and enjoyed it, but I didn't want to teach drivers it anymore <laughs> after that first year. When you got to Glenville State, um, this is where you developed the notion of the spread offense. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure how many people really truly understand how much you basically revolutionized college football. I don't think you were setting out to do that. Tell me about the closest thing to a eureka moment in that process where you made some type of switch or something happened where you thought, I'm going to design something here that really hasn't been done before. And this could be, this could be something different. Well, you know, I think it really happened the first year I was at Glenville and that's when I went over to offense and said, okay, I've been a defensive guy and all that. Yeah, I'm going to go over the offense, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to run. I always been a defensive guy. It was really the second year there. That's when the run and shoot was kind of in vogue in the NFL and, and the Mouse Davis and the Detroit Lions and Houston and all them were doing it. And they were setting all kinds of passing records, but they were also setting records for fumbles and sacks. And, and Warren Moon was getting the heck beat out of him. And uh, we were getting ready to play. It's like the third game of my second year. And so we had put this kind of run and shoot in. But I had a shorter quarterback, only about five foot ten, five foot eleven. But he could throw it. He's real smart. And we're getting ready to play Indiana State, which is a one double A. That was a big money game for us. They were paying us like forty thousand dollars, and we were going to get killed. And this, so I said, you know what? We're going to go in a shotgun, and we're going to run everything out of a shotgun, and we're going to do everything at a two minute drill pace because I thought that was the hardest thing to defend on defense, the two minute drill. And I said, we're just going to do that and just chuck the ball around a little bit and see what happens. So we go out there and we lose. Uh, 63 to 49, but we put up like almost 600 yards and they were so mad. Their coach was so mad. He wouldn't even shake my hand after the game, even though they won because we had this little school putting all these yards at it. And I told the staff after the game, I said, boy, I'm disappointed, but we lost, but I think we found something. I said, if you can find a quarterback, get you some skilled players in space, get five chubby guys to get run over slowly up front of the old line. We got a shot. And then from that point on, we started to develop the run game out of it and practice and, and so the spread, fast, tempo, no huddle thing for us, and then we thought we were the only ones in the country doing it, and nobody probably knew because there's only 500 people coming to the games. It kind of took off there. So we had our own little experimental ground for the next five or six years, and then it wasn't until I went to Tulane and it became on a Division I level that people started really noticing it.